This is the Music History In-Depth Podcast for July 10th through the 16th. On this week's show, we discuss an event that was laced with racial undertones that became known as the Riot That Killed Disco. There's a concert event for the ages, and we say happy birthday to the mother of the MP3. This show goes more in depth about some of the events that we put on our daily podcast, the Music History Today podcast, which drops every single day, including weekends, wherever you get your podcast from. Now, on to this week's episode. First, in order to understand the importance of what happened on July 12th, 1979, you have to understand the context of the times. Back in the 1950s, rock and roll suffered a lot of racial backlash, especially when white kids started liking what was then considered black music. The same thing happened in the 1980s when rap music burst onto the scene in full force. The same thing happened to disco. The genre started in the underground black, Latino, and gay clubs in New York City in the 1960s, but really started to spread into other clubs in other cities in the 1970s. Disco songs like Van McCoy's The Hustle and artists like Donna Summer were getting airplay on R&B and certain pop radio stations and making the Billboard charts, but much like rap music back then, there wasn't a huge tidal wave. That all changed once the movie Saturday Night Fever came out on December 12, 1977. The movie became a huge hit and the soundtrack for it became one of the biggest selling soundtrack albums of all time, coming in second with 40 million copies to Whitney Houston's Bodyguard soundtrack at 50 million. The Bee Gees became the biggest recording artists of the era, disco clubs opened up and everyone started learning all of the disco moves like The Hustle. Roller rinks, which were a thing back in the day, switched their music over from playing rock and pop songs to playing disco songs. You couldn't get away from disco if you tried. Everyone and everything was trying to cash in on the disco trend. Everything had a disco theme. Watch old episodes of the TV shows Chips and The Love Boat, for example. Even they had disco theme songs. On the Billboard charts, disco ruled, and much like how EDM songs took over the charts about a decade ago for a little while, disco did the exact same thing. A lot of local rock and pop music radio stations changed their formats over to disco and put out disco top 10 lists. In short, disco took over the mainstream. Pop and rock artists had chart-topping songs with disco beats. For instance, Rod Stewart had Do You Think I'm Sexy, The Rolling Stones did Miss You, Kiss did I Was Made For Loving You, which ended up being one of their biggest selling songs, Queen did Another One Bites The Dust, even soft rock, easy listening guru Barry Manilow had a disco song called Copacabana, which was also a huge hit. Yet... Despite its global popularity, it was still looked at by a lot of people in America as black, Latino, and gay music that had taken over the music and pop culture landscape from corporate rock groups that had been popular right up until that point, and some people did not like that. The media also helped to fuel the fire by emphasizing the gay culture in disco, and not in a good way, mind you. After disco music won a bunch of major awards at the 1979 Grammy Awards, people's fears about disco completely taking over reached a fever pitch. Disco became that era's culture war, and something had to be done, and that something was what led to the events that happened on July 12, 1979. Earlier in 1979, in Chicago, Illinois, two local DJs, Steve Dahl and Gary Meyer, were angry. Dahl had recently switched radio stations to Rock Radio WLUP because his old station, WDAI-FM, was one of those radio stations that switched formats from rock to disco. To add insult to injury, WDAI had fired Steve on Christmas Eve. I don't care who you are, but firing someone on Christmas Eve is never a good look. 
He famously mocked his old radio station, WDAI's slogan, Disco DAI, and called it Disco D-I-E. How very Elon Musk of him. Steve organized his listeners into an ad hoc group called the Cohos, whose sole mission was to, quote, eradicate the disease, end quote, known as Disco. They held anti-disco events that sometimes got a little out of control. For instance, when a club switched from disco back to rock music in June of 1979, Steve and a thousand of his co-host members showed up to voice their support. And so did a bunch of cops who had a hard time keeping the unruly crowd in line. Later that month, Steve occupied a teen disco, and by occupy, I mean he took over the club with over 7,000 of his co-host group. One time, his old station, WDAI, was doing a promotion at a newly opened disco. Steve and a bunch of his co-hosts showed up and threw a bunch of marshmallows at the promotional van and then chased the van as the WDAI crew were trying to get away until the van was finally cornered in a park and couldn't leave. Thankfully, no one was injured. On July 6, 1979, Van McCoy, whose smash hit single The Hustle was considered the first disco song to hit number one on the Billboard Singles chart, passed away. Steve, being the classy guy that he is, celebrated his death by breaking his record on air. Stay classy, Steve. In this day and age, all of this harassment and borderline assault would have gotten Steve fired along with more than a few lawsuits and probably even arrested. But hey, this was 1979 and a lot of people hated disco and everything that it stood for, so I guess at that point, no harm, no foul. In fact, similar events were happening in other cities. For instance, a radio DJ in Portland, Oregon held an event where he destroyed disco records with a chainsaw. In Seattle, Washington, someone had an event with a mobile dance floor. Hundreds of disco haters showed up and protested the event. One day, Steve and his DJ partner, Gary Meyer, came up with an idea. Roll over disco records with a steamroller like most radio station publicity stunts? Nah, too easy. A chainsaw like the guy in Portland? Nah, think bigger. Why not protest disco by blowing up disco records? Perfect. If only they had a place and a huge audience to do it with. Hmm. Enter Mike Veek. Mike was a baseball executive with the American League baseball team, the Chicago White Sox. He was also the son of White Sox baseball team owner Bill Veek, who was famous for doing crazy publicity stunts, such as having a man who was only four feet tall at bat in order for pitchers to not be able to pitch to him properly. Anyway, after the White Sox came to the radio station looking to do promotions with them, the station came back to Mike with their publicity stunt idea. There was a doubleheader that was scheduled on July 12, 1979 between the Chicago White Sox and the Detroit Tigers as the two teams needed to make up a game that had been rained out on May 2nd of that year. The White Sox, who only two years earlier had done a disco night promotion, were, let's just say, not good. In fact, on the day of the promotion, their record was 40 wins and 47 losses. The Detroit Tigers were slightly better, but even they didn't have a winning record with only 42 wins and 44 losses. The original idea was to blow up the records in a shopping mall parking lot, but what if, between the games, the radio station blew up the disco records on the baseball field? Mike Veek jumped at the chance and then doubled down on it. What if he gave a huge discount on tickets to the second game so people would stick around? And, just to make that deal even better, what if he made the price 98 cents if they brought a disco record to the game so that it could be blown up? They all figured that the normal attendance for Comiskey Park, where the White Sox played for the season, was around 15,000 people because, well, 
they weren't that good a team that year. So maybe they might get a few more thousand people to show up. The deal was made, the stage was set, and the promotional announcements were made on the radio station. Come one, come all. We'll be wild. It turned out that more people showed up to the park that day than they figured. About 33,000 more people. They had expected 15,000 because that was how many people had been showing up to the games. Comiskey Park itself actually held 44,492. Park security that day could handle maybe about 35,000. Yeah, they got 47,795 people to show up. 20,000 of them were in the park itself and another 28,000, give or take a few, milled around on the exterior of the park. Bill Veek, who was actually in the hospital that day for routine tests, checked himself out of the hospital once he heard just how many people showed up as he had an idea, according to him, that this was not going to end well. So, let's see here. Way too many people showing up. Lots of liquor on a hot summer day. Also explosions. Plus a crowd of people who had a history of violence like the Cohos. Okay, what could possibly go wrong with this whole thing? Yeah, as it turns out, plenty. The first game of the doubleheader started at 6 o'clock in the evening. First pitch was thrown out by Laura Lee, who was the scantily clad woman who was in the radio station promotional materials because it was the late 70s and apparently no one had heard of the feminist movement at that point and, well, misogyny and etc., etc. Anywho, the Tigers won the first game, by the way, 4-1. Uh, to one. Pat Underwood was the winning pitcher for the Tigers, bringing his record to 4-0, while Fred Howard was the losing pitcher for the White Sox, bringing his record to 1-4. Game lasted for 2 hours, 38 minutes. During the game, though, security got wind that a lot of the fans who didn't have tickets to the game were trying to break into the stadium, so field security went to help out, and that left the field unprotected which also led to what happened after the first game. The fans brought so many records to the game that they overflowed the crates that were going to be used for the demolition. A lot of the records were not disco records at all. They were just records that were done by black artists. Sure, they brought Donna Summer records, but they also brought Stevie Wonder records, and Stevie was not a disco artist, he was R&B. They also had black country music superstar Charlie Pride's records, and he was about as far removed from disco as possible without being a classical music artist. Because of those variables, a lot of people thought that this was more than just an anti-disco event, but rather an anti-black, Latino, and gay event. Since some of the records weren't collected at the gates, some fans started tossing them around like they were Frisbees, which endangered everybody around them, including the players. Some baseball players even wore their batting helmets while playing in the field so they wouldn't suffer any injuries from the flying vinyl. Other fans outside the stadium took their records, put them in a pile, and lit them on fire, creating a very nauseating bonfire. Then, the main event. While White Sox pitcher Ken Kravec was on the pitcher's mound warming up for his start for the second game, and with other White Sox players in the dugout milling about getting ready for the second game, the two DJs, along with Lorelei, went out to center field in a jeep. The records were brought out onto the field. The dynamite was placed around the records. The DJs riled up the crowd with a disco sucks chant. And the records exploded, tearing a hole in the center field grass. What happened after that could only be called a riot. Fans poured out onto the field, they tore up the field, and then they tore up the stadiums. Seats, part of the stadium wall, if it existed in the park and even outside of it, it was getting vandalized. People then started setting what was left of the records on fire onto the field itself, and soon they had a few bonfires going. 
All this time, there were announcements and stadium signs flashing, telling fans to calmly get back to their seats. Yeah, like that was going to work. Even legendary announcer Harry Carey, who was working the game that day, couldn't get people to calm down. If you tried to escape the park at any point from the end of the first game because you felt that things were going to get just a bit out of control, yeah, you were out of luck. Because of the original disturbances during the first game, security had padlocked all except for one exit. At 9.08 p.m., almost 20 minutes after the whole debacle started, Chicago police came in full riot gear to restore order. Which, when you think about it, 20 minutes, not bad. The White Sox still wanted to play the second game, but Detroit Tigers manager, the legendary Sparky Anderson, did not want his guys playing in case the crowd turned on them. Plus, the field was so torn up because of the riot, there was no way anybody was going to play that second game. The second game was canceled, and the Major League Baseball front office told the Chicago White Sox that they had to forfeit that game. As far as the players in this little drama, not much actually happened. The morning after the riot, Steve Dahl and his partner got on their radio broadcast and made fun of the nasty headlines that the local newspapers had printed about what happened. They ended up keeping their jobs, and they're actually still local media personalities to this day, with Steve now having a podcast, by the way, called the Steve Dahl Podcast. A lot of people blamed what happened on beer and drugs, as a lot of people had been smoking pot that day, apparently. You know, I don't know too many people who smoke pot and decide to riot unless it's because they can't find a bag of munchies, but maybe Chicago does it different. Bill Veek eventually sold the White Sox to Jerry Reinsdorf, who also owned the Chicago Bulls basketball team during the Michael Jordan era. Bill Veek passed away in 1986. Bill's son, Mike, felt that Major League Baseball had blackballed him as he couldn't get a job in baseball for quite some time. That led to bouts of depression and alcohol abuse, according to him, and he eventually ended up buying minor league baseball teams. For the record, by the way, yes, he did hold more events like Disco Demolition Night. In fact, in 2014, one of his baseball clubs, minor league that is, held a night where they destroyed Justin Bieber and Miley Cyrus items because some people just never learned their lessons, I guess. As far as the racial aspect to it all, Steve Dahl denies that race played a factor for his part in any of this, saying in an op-ed in a local newspaper that, quote, The worst thing is people calling disco demolition homophobic or racist. It just wasn't. We weren't thinking like that. End quote. And to him... It was, quote, a romp not of major cultural significance, end quote. I'm actually willing to give him the benefit of the doubt when it comes to his particular thoughts and feelings on the matter. That, however, does not apply to a lot of the other people who were at the game. Among them was WMAQ-TV political journalist Mark W. Anderson, who was a 15-year-old kid at the time when he attended the game. In a rebuke to Steve Dahl's newspaper piece, Anderson wrote, quote, The chance to yell, Disco sucks, meant more than simply a musical style choice. It was a chance to push back on a whole set of social dynamics that lay just beneath the surface of a minor battle between a DJ and a radio station that decided to change formats. More importantly, it was a chance for a whole lot of people to say that they did not like the way the world was changing around them or who they saw as the potential victors in a cultural and demographic war. End quote. Kind of sounds like today, doesn't it? Plus, when people are bringing in albums by black artists to burn, regardless of whether they were disco artists or not, you kind of can't help but think that there was maybe a racial element to all of this. You know, just saying. Whether Steve meant it to be or not. 
Two more fun facts about this little sordid event in music history that actually have nothing to do with music. First, while it was the last American League game to be forfeited due to a promotional stunt gone awry, it was not the last Major League Baseball game to be forfeited. That dishonor goes to the 1995 National League team, the Los Angeles Dodgers, who had to forfeit a game on August 10th, 1995 against the St. Louis Cardinals due to a baseball giveaway promotion that got so nuts that we're not even going to get into it here because it has nothing to do with music. But think about how bad it would be to give away baseballs so bad that you had to forfeit a game. You get the picture. The other fun fact is that someone who later became famous in the world of entertainment was on the field during the disco demolition night riot and participated in the rioting. And no, it wasn't Bill Murray. A 21-year-old aspiring actor got onto the field and while the riot was going on, he slid into third base, stole a bat from out of one of the dugouts, and also had his silver belt buckle stolen off of him. This actor eventually went on to earn an Academy Award nomination for Best Supporting Actor for the role of John Coffey in the movie The Green Mile based on a Stephen King story, and which co-starred opposite Tom Hanks. Oh, he also played the kingpin in the Ben Affleck Daredevil movie, and was in the movies Armageddon, Sin City, and Talladega Nights, The Ballad of Ricky Bobby. I am coming for you, Ricky Bobby. The actor who sadly passed away in 2012 at the age of 54... Mr. Michael Clark Duncan, who was one of the rioters that day on the field. In any event, what the riot really showed was that public sentiment towards disco had quickly shifted. After that, disco died a quick death, at least what people called disco at that time. If you were associated with disco, like the Bee Gees, you became a laughingstock and your career was effectively dead canceled. Over. Another genre didn't become a hot new trend in America until New Wave came onto the scene in the early 1980s, thanks largely to the debut of MTV. It was already relatively popular in the United Kingdom by the time America caught wind of it. Much like a villain in a 1980s horror movie franchise, however, disco only looked like it died. Disco just went underground again and went back to the clubs in New York City and Chicago, Illinois. DJs like Frankie Knuckles and Ron Hardy took major elements of it and made new music with it at clubs like The Warehouse in Chicago. They called the music House Music, which was the name that club kids in Chicago called it when they went into the record stores and said, hey, I'm looking for that house record that was played at the house the other day at the show. They just shortened the name Warehouse to House, which is where house music gets its name from. Then there were three kids nicknamed the Belleville Three. They were Juan Atkins, Derek May, and Kevin Saunderson. They took elements of the group Kraftwerk, combined it with disco, threw in a touch of rock music, and created techno music in the clubs in Detroit, Michigan. House and techno hopped the pond to England and became a major part of the rave culture, especially in the 1990s, and then spread throughout Europe to places like Berlin and Amsterdam, until it exploded just over a decade or so ago into the cultural force now known as EDM or electronic dance music. Ironically, original disco artists like Chic and the Bee Gees are now popular again, with Chic selling out stadiums worldwide to this very day. In fact, if you follow Nile Rogers' Instagram account, since he is the guitarist and the mastermind of Chic, you will see that he is on a European tour. Funny how the world works. However, in the late 1970s and the early 1980s, it definitely looked like disco was killed off for good. 
And while Steve Dahl and Gary Meyer didn't realize it at the time, they in effect accomplished what they wanted to do at that point. They put the final nail in the coffin of disco as people knew it back in the 1970s, and it all happened on Disco Demolition Night in Chicago, Illinois, on July 12th, 1979. Before we go any further, we'd like to tell you about our other podcasts. The Music History Today podcast goes over the daily events in music history and drops daily, including weekends, on YouTube and wherever you get your podcasts. There's also the Music Halls of Fame podcast, which talks about a member of the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame, along with other Music Halls of Fame's museums and walks of fame. The Music Halls of Fame podcast drops every Thursday and can also be found on YouTube and wherever you get your podcasts. Now, back to this podcast. This next event is still known as the biggest charity concert event ever held. It's also sometimes used as the template for using music as a fundraising tool. Live Aid has developed a rather mythical existence over the decades, mainly because of a few iconic performances. For those not in the know, though, Live Aid was not the first charity benefit concert, even though some people would have you believe that. No. Charity concerts have actually been around forever. For instance, there was George Harrison's 1971 concert for Bangladesh, which was actually two concerts that were held at Madison Square Garden in New York City to aid refugees from East Pakistan who were struggling after tropical cyclone Bola and also the Bangladesh war genocide that had occurred around that time. There were the late 1970s and early 1980s Secret Policeman Balls concert, which aided the British unit of Amnesty International. Live Aid, though, has stood the test of time and become one of those Generation X time markers. How did it get to that point? Well, what we're going to do is go back, way back, back in the time. All right, actually, we're just going back to the mid-1980s, when a journalist did a story that planted a seed that made all of the difference and got the ball rolling. Starting in 1983, journalist Michael Bjork was reporting on a famine in the country of Ethiopia for BBC News. The famine was part of the Ethiopian civil war that had been going on ever since Ethiopian head of state Mangistu Haley Marjum seized power in 1978 until he was finally overthrown in 1991. On October 23, 1984, the BBC put one of Michael's reports on the air that struck a chord worldwide. It was about a nurse for one of the relief agencies. The nurse was named Claire Birchinger. Her unenviable task was to help decide which, out of over 85,000 people at a refugee camp, would get the needed aid for a particular day. It was her job to put marks on children who would receive the aid that day and would live, while the vast majority would not get marks and would soon die. A 1984 diary entry that she made while she was stationed at a feeding station there said, quote, There are thousands of people outside. I have counted 10 rows, and each row has more than 100 people in it, and I can only take 60 to 70 children today, but they all need to come in, end quote. It traumatized her so much that she didn't even talk about it for over 20 years, finally saying in an interview, quote, I felt like a Nazi sending people to the death camps. Why was I in this situation? Why was it possible in this time of plenty that some have food and some do not? It is not right, end quote. For her part, Claire retired in 2024 from nursing, 
Michael Bjork's report about Claire and the famine moved the British public so much that people started giving tons of money to organizations like Save the Children. The report was also shown in America, which was unheard of back in the 1980s. The report also moved one man into action. Back in the early 1980s, Bob Geldof was known as being the lead singer of the group The Boomtown Rats. Their big hit was the song I Don't Like Mondays. On October 23, 1984, he and his then-wife, Paula Yates, were watching the BBC report on the Ethiopian famine and decided to raise money to help with relief efforts. Bob got on the phone and called his friend Midge Ure of the group Ultravox. They got together a bunch of their famous friends, and on November 25th, they recorded a charity single that they wrote that month called Do They Know It's Christmas, which was released on November 30th and went on to become one of the top five biggest selling singles of all time, raising over $8 million for famine relief. The time frame from the BBC report being shown to the song coming out was right around five weeks. The song also inspired USA for Africa's We Are the World, which was written by Michael Jackson and Lionel Richie. Among the artists who sang on Do They Know It's Christmas was Boy George of the group Culture Club. At the end of Culture Club's show on December 22, 1984 at Wembley Stadium, he sang a version of the song with some celebrities on stage. He was so overcome with emotion that he contacted Bob Geldof and suggested that there should be a charity concert held. Bob already had the wheels turning in his head. In a January 1985 interview with Melody Maker magazine, Bob said, quote, The show should be as big as is humanly possible. There's no point in just 5,000 fans turning up at Wembley. We need to have Wembley link with Madison Square Garden's Okay, he screwed up. It's actually Garden, but whatever. And the whole show should be televised worldwide. It would be great for Duran, that would be Duran Duran, to play three or four numbers at Wembley and then flick to Madison Square where Springsteen, of course Bruce Springsteen, would be playing. And while he's on, the Wembley stage could be made ready for the next British act like the Thompsons, he meant the Thompson Twins, or whoever. In that way, lots of acts could be featured and the television rights, tickets, and so on could raise a phenomenal amount of money. It's not an impossible idea and certainly one worth exploiting. End quote. Minus my little ins there. Anyway, Bob and Midge got to work. First, they hired promoter Harvey Goldsmith to do the Wembley concert and legendary promoter Bill Graham to do the American concert. Television producer Tony Verna got on board and through his connections with Philadelphia's mayor, who he had a good relationship with, he secured Philly's John F. Kennedy Stadium. Through his TV network connections, he got ABC Television to broadcast a three-hour primetime live version of the American portion with tape-delayed British performances. Dick Clark hosted the American broadcast. MTV handled almost all of both concerts. The way that Bob got a lot of the performers to do the shows was to, well, let's be honest, he lied to them. He would tell one guy, for instance, that another guy was going to do the show and then tell the other guy that the first guy was going to do the show. They were also going to try to do a live duet between David Bowie in London and Mick Jagger in Philadelphia. However, with technology being what it was back in the day, they couldn't get the signals to sync up properly, so they abandoned that idea. And instead, they showed the music video for Bowie and Jagger's version of the Martha and the Vandellas hit song Dancing in the Streets and played it in both stadiums at almost the exact same time, give or take like 10 seconds. The Wembley Stadium portion started at noon British time on July 13, 1985 on the BBC with the words, quote, It's 12 noon in London, 7 a.m. in Philadelphia, and all around the world, it's time for Live Aid. 
or something like that. End quote. The vast majority of it was held in mono. You didn't watch it in stereo unless you were one of the fortunate ones who had an expensive stereo television set back in the day. If you were listening to it on radio, then you got a stereo version. Also, the BBC version was commercial free. The American version, on the other hand, of course, was filled with commercials and interviews, so American audiences missed a bunch of the performances. Also, because some artists crossed over time-wise, certain acts like the reunion of Crosby, Stills, Nash & Young were not even shown. The Wembley show opened with the British Army Regiment, the Coldstream Guards, opening with the Royal Salute, which is the very short version, six bars basically, of God Save the King, which at that point in time was God Save the Queen because Queen Elizabeth II was still alive. But that's neither here nor there. Prince, now King Charles, and the late great Princess Diana were at the stadium for the beginning of the concert. Status Quo was the first band on stage. They did three songs. Also, it was the last time that Status Quo lineup actually played together as they lost bassist Alan Lancaster and drummer Pete Kircher right after the concert was over with. And by lost, I don't mean they died. They quit. The Style Council played four songs, including You're the Best Thing and Walls Come Tumbling Down. Then, the Boomtown Rats, with Bob Geldof, played next, singing I Don't Like Mondays and two other songs. Adam Ant did the song Viva La Rock. Later on, Adam would criticize Live Aid as, quote, the death of rock and roll, end quote. If only he knew that the Macarena was coming in the 90s. Now that was the death of rock and roll. Anyway, Midge Ure's band Ultravox was up after that. By this time in his friendship with Geldof, Mitch kind of felt pushed aside by Bob, as to Midge, it seemed like Bob really wanted to take over the Live Aid project and to take all the credit and spotlight for himself, which actually kind of happened, because when you think Live Aid, you don't think Midge, you think Bob. Then Spandau Ballet came out and did their three biggest hits. It was during this point that the American concert started. More on those performances later. Then Elvis Costello did a cover of the Beatles song, All You Need Is Love. Nick Kershaw came up and did four songs, including his big hit, Wouldn't It Be Good. Charday performed three songs. Sting, Phil Collins, and saxophonist Branford Marsalis performed together and did four Sting songs and two Phil Collins songs. Phil's performance was actually pretty unique. He performed at both concerts and became the first act to play concerts in Europe and America on the exact same day. After he finished his performance, Phil got to the airport in a helicopter and took the British Airways Concorde over to America, landed at Kennedy Airport in New York City, then took a helicopter to Philadelphia, and performed a set at Kennedy Stadium. For those not in the know, the Concorde was fully operational at that time and flew supersonic. Flight time between New York City and London was around four hours, give or take a few minutes. The plane wouldn't be taken out of commission until 2003, and surprisingly, there has not been supersonic commercial aviation since, which is kind of strange when you think about all the technology that's been going around the past 21 years or so by now. There was actually another person who Phil picked up for his ride from New York to Philly, quite by accident. On that very Concord flight was Cher, who was somehow oblivious to the fact that Live Aid was even going on. After she saw Phil on the plane, she wanted in. She went to the concert with him, stood by the side of the stage and watched, and then got up on stage when, at the very end of the American portion, they all sang We Are the World. Meanwhile, back at Wembley, Howard Jones did the song Hide and Seek. Then Brian Ferry and David Gilmour came on stage and did four songs, including Slave to Love and his cover of John Lennon's Jealous Guy. Paul Young came on stage and did four songs, the intro to Do They Know It's Christmas, since he sang the opening line in the song, the song That's the Way Love Is with Alison Moyer, along with Every Time You Go Away and Come Back and Stay, which were his two biggest hits. 
The first memorable performance happened next. In a set that still gets talked about, U2 performed two songs for 30 minutes, Sunday Bloody Sunday and an extra long performance of the song Bad, where Bono went into the crowd and danced with a fan in the front part of the stage pit, so much so that actually the band didn't even know where he was because they didn't see him. You couldn't at that point. He was so far down. So they just kept playing. You two were relatively famous at that point, coming off of popular albums War in 1983 and The Unforgettable Fire in 1984. They would become even more well-known after this performance and became superstars with the 1987 album The Joshua Tree. Dire Straits came up next and did Money for Nothing and Sultans of Swing. When Sting walked out on stage to sing on Money for Nothing, MTV VJ Nina Blackwood said on air, quote, What is Sting doing out there? End quote. Completely forgetting that even though she had introduced the video for the song a million times on the channel, that Sting was the one who sang the famous lyrics, I want my MTV on the song, and who also co-wrote the song and was there to sing his lyrics live. Go figure. After their set came the one part of Live Aid that everybody remembers, Queen. And the legend of the performance has only grown ever since. If you saw the movie Bohemian Rhapsody, then you already know what led up to the performance and what was at stake with Freddie Mercury's vocal cords and what a risk he was taking at the time. I invite you to go see that movie or at least pull it up on your streaming service because it's a good movie. As Tony Headley of Spandau Ballet said, before the performance, all of the bands were just going through the motions. They were just there to be there and to lend support. Queen were the group who took the moment seriously and gave a performance that at one time was voted as the single greatest performance in rock music history. I personally would have gone with Jimi Hendrix at Monterey, but that's not my list. Queen started with part of Bohemian Rhapsody, Radio Gaga with the crowd clapping in unison, just like the music video for the song, the famous call and response with the crowd, Hammer to Fall, Crazy Little Thing Called Love, We Will Rock You and We Are the Champions. One half hour that can only be described as goosebumps. Donations to organizations that collected for the famine relief shot up right after Queen's performance. David Bowie had to follow that up, but really, he's David Bowie, so you know that he kept the magic going. He performed TVC 15, Rebel Rebel, Modern Love, and Heroes. Bowie was going to do the song five years. However, there was a music video that he wanted played on the broadcast that showed starving kids and was set to the song from the cars called Drive. Bob Geldof said that there was no time on the schedule for it. So Bowie said that he would cut one of his songs out of his set in exchange for them playing it, which they did. Then came The Who, who did four songs and whose television feed for one of the songs cut out for a minute because of a blown fuse, and it was right in the middle of my generation as Roger Daltrey sang, Why Don't You All Fade Away? And then they did, for one minute. Elton John did six songs, including Don't Go Breaking My Heart with Kiki D and Don't Let the Sun Go Down on Me with Wham, who strangely didn't do a set of their own music at the concert, even though they were mega popular at the time. Freddie Mercury and Brian May came back out to perform Is This the World We Created? And then Paul McCartney came out and performed Let It Be. Paul said that his management told him that he should do the concert. By management, he meant his kids. Organizers actually had wanted a former Beatle to perform, as three of them were still alive at that point, as they felt that it lent credit to the cause. After Paul finished, a bunch of performers sang, Do They Know It's Christmas? And that was it. The British edition ended at around 10 o'clock that night, 10 hours after it had started. The American concert is the one that never seems to really get talked about. We're actually not 
going to go over every set list like the British one because of that. We have, however, put the entire set list and the start times for both the American and the British concerts in the show notes for you to look at. We will, however, note four things about the American version. First, a lot of British acts played in Philadelphia instead of in London, like Eric Clapton, Duran Duran, Black Sabbath, Simple Minds, and Judas Priest. Second, there was a rather disastrous Led Zeppelin reunion with Phil Collins playing drums, which was so bad that when the concerts were issued out on DVD, Led Zeppelin refused to allow their performance to be put on them. Therefore, if you didn't see it as it happened, you will never see it. At least not if Led Zeppelin continues to get their way. Phil Collins, by the way, was blamed by Jimmy Page for how bad the performance was, even though Robert Plant's voice was kind of scratchy at that point, and he could barely sing as it was. Another group who also didn't want their performance to be shown on the DVD version is Santana, who also performed in Philadelphia. Third, Run DMC was the only hip-hop act to perform there, as rap had not taken hold of the mainstream not quite yet. It wasn't actually until the next year that Run DMC came out with the Smash album Raising Hell and the Smash trend-setting song Walk This Way. They even referenced their Live Aid performance on Raising Hell with the classic song My Adidas. When they rapped, quote, I stepped on stage at Live Aid, all the people gave an applause that paid, end quote. We'll get back to Run DMC in a few minutes. Fourth, Phil Collins finished his record-breaking performance by doing his set that he did in London again in Philadelphia. There were other performances on the broadcast that were not in either London or Philadelphia. Organizers held events on the same day worldwide. The group's Loudness and Off Course, along with four other artists, performed six songs in a studio in Japan. The group Austria for Africa performed one song in Vienna. B.B. King performed four songs in The Hague in Netherlands. The group You Rock Messiha performed a song in Belgrade in what was once called Yugoslavia and is now called Serbia. Autograph did two songs in Moscow. Band for Africa did two songs in Cologne, West Germany. Stavanger for Africa and Forente Artister performed two songs in Norway. Cool and the Gang did two songs in a music studio. Cliff Richard, who couldn't perform live at Wembley due to a prior concert commitment, instead did a performance via videotape. There was also a full festival that was held on the same day in Sydney, Australia, called Oz for Africa. The headliners for that festival were Men at Work, who were extremely popular at that point, in excess just before they put out their late 1985 album Listen Like Thieves and then became superstars with the 1987 album Kick and the Little River Band, who were already extremely popular in the 1970s in America, but everybody forgot that they were actually an Australian band, not an American one. Go figure. The full set lists and presenters for all of these worldwide performances, by the way, are also in the show notes for you. There were some criticisms of the performances. Aside from Led Zeppelin, Bob Dylan came under fire. During the intro to the song When the Ship Comes In, he said, quote, I hope that some of the money that's raised for the people in Africa, maybe they can just take a little bit of it, maybe one or two million, maybe, and use it, say, to pay the mortgages on some of the farms that the farmers here owe to the banks, end quote. Dylan caught a lot of heat for suggesting that, and he later apologized for it, saying that it wasn't the time or the place to say something like that and to try to take the shine off of the whole African thing by putting it on to the American farmer. However, while the comment was criticized, it did plant an idea in the heads of John Mellencamp, Willie Nelson, and Neil Young to start their own version of Live Aid called Farm Aid and to do those charity concerts to help the American farmers. Some artists like Tears for Fears, Culture Club, Huey Lewis and the News, 
Deep Purple, Prince, Michael Jackson, and Bruce Springsteen either didn't think it was a worthy event to be a part of, that would be Tears for Fears, Bruce Springsteen, Richie Blackmore of Deep Purple, and Huey Lewis and the News, or didn't want to appear in person, but they did donate songs and videos, Culture Club and Prince, or were busy with prior commitments, Michael Jackson making a record, and Cliff Richard with that prior charity event that he was already a part of, or were sick. For instance, Annie Lennox of the Eurythmics, who had a throat infection that day and couldn't even sing. Or they were actually upset because they weren't invited to play. For instance, Rush never got an invitation. Then Lizzie never got an invitation. And Roger Waters, who was invited, but only if he put Pink Floyd back together. He did not. They did get back together for one event, though, 20 years later. That was the Live 8 concerts that happened in 2005. For some artists, doing shows for free just wasn't their thing regardless of whether it was serving the common good. Greedy, greedy, greedy. Still others like Adamant and presenter for the BBC that day, Andy Kershaw, who were at Live Aid but later criticized the whole thing. One artist that Geldof was actually upset for showing up at the concert was the Philadelphia hometown band, The Hooters, whose breakthrough album Nervous Night came out three months earlier and had the hit songs All You Zombies and and We Danced. Those songs both hit the top 10 at that point and had snagged the opening slot in America. Geldof still didn't think that they were popular enough to get the opening slot. Ironically, Bob Geldof opened up for The Hooters during a tour in 2004, so... uh, Yeah, funny how the world works. There was also criticism that while there were a lot of black performers at the American concerts, only Charday and saxophonist Branford Marsalis were there in London. One would have figured that a more diverse lineup would have been good, especially if the concerts were to benefit a country in Africa of all places. This criticism would be leveled against Bob Geldof and crew again 20 years later when organizers were announcing the original lineup for the 2005 Alive 8 concert, which at that time also only had one black performer. And so when they got the accusations of the whole white savior routine, they then went and put out a lot more, at least at that point. There were also accusations that funds were not going to relief groups, but to the Ethiopian government and their cronies. Indeed, some money was alleged to have gone to buy guns for the authoritarian government, and also there were accusations that food and medical supplies did not go to starving people, but rather to the parts of the population that supported the government. The more things change, the more they stay the same. In any event, there was a four-disc DVD set that came out in late 2004. Aside from Led Zeppelin and Santana, other artists were cut from the DVD release for whatever reasons. Artists like Rick Springfield, The Hooters, Billy Ocean, Cool and the Gang, The Four Tops, and The Power Station. Still others had parts of their sets cut, like Madonna, who had one song cut out of her set. Some had parts re-recorded. For instance, Paul McCartney had microphone issues during his original performance of Let It Be at Wembley Stadium, being the very smart performer that he is, and figuring that the event would eventually come out in some format at some time in the future, Paul went into a studio two weeks after Live Aid and re-recorded his song. And it is the version on the DVD That's actually the studio version, not the original live version with all the microphone issues. Also, Live Aid started their own YouTube channel, and you can watch some of the performances there, including a few that did not make the DVD cut, like Cool in the Gang's performance of their song Cherish, along with interviews and backstage stuff. It also had a good chunk of the international performances, and we will throw that link to it in the show notes for you as well. 
regardless of the criticism of the concerts or where the funds from the concerts were going, the shows actually did do a lot of good. They raised over $150 million for famine relief. Now, you can argue whether it went to the right place or not. You can argue whether the performances were any good. I would say most of them, probably not. You could argue whether the whole event was just Bob Geldof's ego run amok. Uh, probably. Yeah, probably. <laughs> what can't be argued, though, is that Live Aid influenced other charity concerts and events, such as Farm Aid and Comic Relief. It spawned the quote-unquote sequels, Live 8 in 2005 and Live Earth in 2007. Plus, it has stood the test of time and become one of the most memorable concert events in pop culture history. Will something like Live Aid ever happen again? Well, to be honest, I'm not sure. It was a different time back then, different circumstances with different political factions. We had a Cold War going on. Soviet Union was huge, that sort of thing. While there are festivals, including the yearly Global Citizen Concert that's held in Central Park in New York City every summer that draw attention to certain issues, I'm not sure that anyone these days, except for maybe a global company like, say, Live Nation, could or would even attempt to do a single-day humongous worldwide event that has worldwide contributions and is for a good cause. Plus, the world seems to be veering into a far-right society at this point, especially in Europe and America, where people can't even agree on lunch, let alone on helping people who are less fortunate. So I'm not quite sure that the right dedication is there at the moment to pull something like Live Aid off again. I could be wrong, though. I hope I am, anyway. Here's to hope. The legendary concert event that was Live Aid was held on July 13th, 1985. There was something else that happened this week in music history concerning the supergroup Cream, but we're going to talk about that in two weeks when the group Cream actually played their first show together. For now, we will briefly mention that on July 16th, 1966, the group Cream was formed. Now, with that honorable mention out of the way, let's get on quickly to this week's birthday because this podcast is already stretching to the hour point. This week's birthday is a singer whose two biggest hits were from the exact same album, though the hits were actually three years apart. This artist was born on July 11, 1959 in Santa Monica, California. Her parents divorced after her birth. Her mom remarried and moved to New York City. She went to the New York High School for the Performing Arts, or as it's more popularly known, the Fame School, after the hit movie and TV show of the 1980s. After high school, she went to college for English literature, but she also performed in the small Greenwich Village cafes and bars. It was at the Cornelia Street Cafe that she got her big break. She was a contributor to the Monday Night Songwriting Group. She also hooked up with the Fast Folk record label, and it was from this that she got herself a major record deal. Her debut album did pretty well, both with the critics and the general public, although it was actually more popular over in England than it was here in America. She also had a minor hit overseas with the song Left of Center with Joe Jackson off of the Pretty in Pink soundtrack. Now, normally when your first album does well, you suffer from the quote-unquote sophomore jinx on your next album. Her second album actually did even better than her first album. It garnered two hits. The first, released in 1987, was about an abused child. It went on to get three Grammy Award nominations, including Record and Song of the Year, losing Record of the Year to Paul Simon's Graceland and Song of the Year to Linda Ronstan and James Ingram's Somewhere Out There from the animated movie An American Tale. In 
Her second hit off of that album had a very strange story all its own. The a cappella original version of the song was written in 1982. It's based on a place at the corner of Broadway and West 112th Street in New York City on the Upper West Side. That place would also become famous later on for being featured all the time in a TV show about nothing. In 1987, the a cappella version was released on one of the Fast Folk record label albums. And later that year, the song was featured on this artist's own album. The a cappella version of the song, however, went absolutely nowhere. About three years later, the dance producer's DNA took the song, put a funky slow dance beat to it, and released it, all of course without her consent or permission. Her record label could have sued DNA for copyright infringement, and the song could never have seen the light of day. Instead, they got smart. They bought the song from DNA and released the song as this artist's own single. The dance remix became her biggest hit. It is also because of the a cappella version of this song that she is known as the mother of the MP3, for it was this song that German scientist Karl Heinz Brandenburg and his audio engineers used in order to test the bit rates of the MP3 format while they were developing it. These days, this artist is an activist. She still writes songs, puts out albums, and does concerts in small venues. However, she will be forever known for her two hits off of her 1987 sophomore album, Solitude Standing. And if you listen to those 80s hit channels on your streams, then you probably have heard the song about the abused child named Luca who lived on the second floor, who lived upstairs from you. I think you may have seen him before. Great song, by the way. Excellent song. Does not get enough airplay, in my opinion, but that's for another day. As for the song that made her known as the mother of the MP3, the DNA remix version is all over your 90s music stream radio stations and whatnot. The exterior, by the way, of its subject matter that was featured every single week on that TV show about nothing, that show was Seinfeld. It's actually known as Tom's Restaurant. The name of the song, however, is Tom's Diner. Happy birthday to singer-songwriter and mother of the MP3, Miss Suzanne Vega, born July 11th, 1959. And that is it for the Music History In-Depth podcast for July 10th through the 16th. Thanks for listening and watching.